Well, hello there, and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 429. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash the like, hit subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and leave me a comment down below if there's anything in the show that grabs your interest or you get a little ha-ha, hee-hee, please make sure that you're helping me with the algorithm and leaving those little comments in the comment section. It goes a long way to help with the virality of the show. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, a five-star review, downloading and sharing it, sending it to a postcard to a friend, sticking it on the back of your head, or just, you know, sticking it on the back of a post-it note and then sticking it on the back of a stranger as you're walking past them. If they shouldn't be near anybody, will go a long way to help me too. And of course, support via Patreon. It's always more than welcome at patreon.com for just Agostino. You'll be able to find one bonus episode and many more bonus episodes on the Patreon subscriber-only platform. So make sure you join there at patreon.com for slash Agostino. That's patreon.com for just Agostino. You know, get involved, get joined in there today. Don't delay. What are you waiting for? How are you doing? How are you feeling? We're midweek now. Midweek. Um, the vibe is strong, the vibe is good. Uh blah, 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 blah. what are we what are we saying this week? We're not saying that much really, are we? Not to be honest. I'm still coming, I'm still kind of uh processing the pain of nearly losing my laptop. So that's been pretty cool experience to go through, to be honest. Um apart from that, nothing else really has been booming on the old uh, TL and also known as a timeline. Oh, United played yesterday and won nine 0 against Southampton with a couple of dubious uh penalty and red card calls. Um, very very strange no sorry well I guess a potential dubious red card call and then Arsenal lost and then had two players sent off for both uh, dubious reasons too um, and this kind of opened up a wider conversation in the UK which is something really tired and people have obviously spoke about this ad nauseum but the standard of refereeing in the Premier League or the lack of um, acknowledgement of how bad it is is very concerning like it's terrible the officials are horrible it was always going to be the fact though right whenever VAR came in I was always under the assumption you see a lot in politics right whenever someone gets something wrong because there's some there's this weird idea in politics or in public life that you're not meant to get things wrong you're meant to be an oracle of all wisdom so when you do have a little bit of a social faux pas you're kind of encouraged to just deflect right and try your best to spin that story into something positive for yourself even though the stuff that you got wrong is a negative per se you're just encouraged to always do that so when it comes to referees, I wasn't surprised that when VAR got introduced, so which is the video assisting refereeing, which essentially allows referees in football to um, consult a screen on the side of the pitch in order to make sure that they got their decision right or wrong. Now, the process is a bit complicated. Sometimes if there's a foul on the pitch and a referee missed it, VAR can not let them know and then they can decide to go to the side of the pitch. Or it's a case of the referee um, then requesting the assistance of the, of the virtual assistant in order to kind of get more information and maybe get a second opinion on what happened. But regardless, the whole crux of the issue is that there's a screen on the side of the pitch that allows the referee to see the incident from various angles, slowed down, sped up, so that they can make a far more informed decision. Because you know, it's you know, mistakes are going to happen. You're you're at the you know at the top of the footballing ladder. The players are you know of a far better quality. The ball moves very fast, especially in the Premier League, especially in all English football, in all leagues in England. To be honest, um, that's one thing that people kind of um, always say about our footballing style is that the ball does move around the pitch very quickly. Players go into each other 100 miles per hour. You know, sometimes you might miss things. So the screen is basically there to assist these referees, to give them um, an idea, a help, a point as to how they can go about doing whatever they're going to do next This in terms of decision. But it was to no surprise to me that when VAR got introduced, it actually led to, it actually led to more mistakes once they consult the screen or with the screen being this place than what it was prior. Because what ends up happening is that you don't want to look a fool. So you don't want to go to the screen, see something you obviously missed, and then go back and rescind it. That takes somebody with, you know, um, uh, a moral backbone, right? That takes somebody with some sort of level of character and integrity. You want to just, you know, pretend that you are right and basically write off and say, no, I didn't miss nothing and continue on. Or you just want to purposely fudge the rules and you know just do some like if again the the, the the arsenal one is an odd one because the david louise one i think no one is suggesting that it's not a penalty 
even though it's a soft penalty, no one's just because you know that that same incident outside the box is always going to be a free kick. It happens all the time. Uh, a player purposely crosses in, crosses in front of another one. They either clip themselves or they get clipped, and it's always a free kick. It's annoying, but it is always a free kick. It is what it is. Um, cool, that happens. But if it's a penalty because it's in the box and you know it's a foul, why is it then a red card? Because it's not as if they stopped a got a clear goal scoring opportunity. Running in on goal, facing a goalkeeper is a fifty fifty chance of scoring. I'd imagine it's not like being in a penalty spot, right? There's so many other things outside of you just finishing, right? The defenders left and right, other players distracting you, the goal getting smaller and smaller because the goalkeeper is coming out. It's not as easy as people think just to go and score one on one. So you would imagine there'd be a little bit more understanding around that but it doesn't seem to be it just seems to be this real okay let's go by the letter of the rule letter of the law and then when the letter of the law doesn't fit let's maybe switch how we're doing it and then go from another level it's just a very very confusing to kind of understand exactly where we are at with football and where it's at with the rules but it must be really annoying for a player you can't really celebrate goals you can't get too excited after games because you never know when something's just going to get completely pulled up um, you could go into a really like, you know, aggressive, you know, send a message. So sort of challenges are kind of off the table unless you really get the ball and you clear it the other way. Right. They're kind of off the table now because when you rewind those things in slow motion, they look horrible. Right. Those kind of crunching tackles in from the side that defenders do in order to kind of, you know, stamp their throat in the game, disrupt the rhythm of the opposing team. You can't really do that anymore. And it should turn into a weird game. It's kind of turning into what basketball's turning into now, where it's essentially non-contact. Right? Yeah? Any form of contact, you can flop on the floor and gain an advantage for your team. Um, it's a bit strange, but hey, I guess that is the nature of the beast. But again, it's just interesting to see that there is no recourse they never get pulled up on what they're actually doing and what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. It's just, uh, no, nah, let's just continue as normal. You know, you made a mistake or did you? Um, let's just go from there. So it's, it's a strange process, but what can you do? Um, Happy United won 9 nil. actually. I wouldn't say... No, I actually was. Let me not regret. Let me not rewrite history. It was a nine 0 performance. We absolutely bad Southampton as soon as they got a player sent off, which doesn't always happen. Sometimes a player gets sent off for the opposing team and it galvanizes them. And then you know the moment they kind of hang on until the half time, it then casts doubt on the team with the advantage. And then you never know they score a goal on the break, and then you're kind of bemoaning the fact that you know I'm hitting your head against the wall. How do you lose against ten men? So it's not always easy to finish teams off when they're ten men, especially at the level where we're at the Premier league right every team essentially is playing for something i think if you're facing 10 men and you're real madrid and you're facing you know alicante or you know celta vigo you're definitely going to win right because you know they're just going to roll over and lie down uh, lie down and roll over sorry but in the in the premier league every team has something to play for so they can't afford just to throw away points um even a performance is needed right that's going to help them for the next match so um yeah really happy again a, a very wide range of players scored great performances throughout i'd probably say luke shaw might be in my mind the match even though he only played the first half um, i thought he was really good um social decision to drop pogba or give him a rest kind of paid off basically we were um we kind of got through the game scot free um no pun intended scott matomas got a pretty decent goal uh, Van der Beek came on but was a, was a bit too quiet for my liking I still think he's a he's a fantastic player I just think he needs to come in and exert more influence on the game and get on the ball a bit more he kind of tends to run into the gaps and behind where he thinks he's going to get found by his teammates like he did at Ajax but we don't play that kind of football and we don't really have the players to do that apart from Pogba to kind of find those balls over the top and get him in so he needs to kind of get on the ball a bit more um, but obviously the ability is still there. Martial scored a couple of goals, which was good. Cavani scored a goal too. That's good. Rashford scored a goal. That's good, right? Daniel James scored a goal. That's even good for the squad morale. It's all good um, going forward. So yeah, nine nil, eleven points now. Man City. Can we win the league? Probably not. I'm still, I'm still not sold on the idea of us winning the league with this coach and with this collection of players it's just too mismatched um the coach is just too mediocre it just doesn't make any sense um if it does happen then it'll be one of the only times i can imagine or i can think of in recent years where a coach who everybody kind of agrees isn't elite wins the premier league with the players that we have as well we've got some great players don't get me wrong but i still think it's a little bit of a mismatch of a squad it doesn't really make sense um you look at the back line 
You look at our full backs, we kind of lopsided, not really the best on the ball. Um, Luke Shaw's obviously improved. Aaron Masaka's doing the best he can for his abilities. But then we play out the ball from the back. Um, Maguire is not really an £80 million centre back. He's good, he's decent enough, but he's not an £80 million centre back. Definitely not a captain uh, of Man United um, level centre back. But hey, it is what it is. He doesn't have the good thing about him is that he's resilient, he never gets injured for the most part, he's always ever present. But he doesn't really have much of a partnership with anybody, really, right? He kind of plays with Lindelof, then Bailly sometimes. Uh, Solskjaer has somehow convinced himself that Lindelof is the best option from Bailly and Lindelof, which I don't agree with. I still would say Bailly is our best centre-back at the club. I think he's even better than Harry Maguire, but, you know, that's a conversation for another day. Um, then we don't have a, a one world-class defensive midfielder, so you always have to play a double pivot. That's my interpretation. Maybe Solskjaer just likes playing a double pivot. I don't know. Maybe that's the case. Um, if that is the case, then, you know, uh, I question that. So we don't have two. We don't have one great defensive midfielder. So we have to play two. And the two that he usually tends to go for is Fred but they're not really good on the ball. So they lose possession a lot, but they're decent at tackling. Then you've got up forward from there, midfielders. You've got what? Bruno Fernandes, who I don't really think is a midfielder. I kind of count him as a what as a 10.5 as a 9.5 in terms of numbers um he gets in the box a lot and he should be really given the f a free role to kind of do what he wants and have you know have a solid midfield base behind him but i guess we don't really have the bodies to do that at the moment and then you got rashford who you know can obviously be an incredibly clutch player but is incredibly erratic um doesn't really have a brain it seems like in terms of pass selection team seems to make way too many of the wrong choices but he, again like i said he always comes up clutch um you got greenwood who's still developing you got james who i don't think is good enough at this level um yeah there's still a bit of a mismatch cavani and martial competing for the number nine i guess martial in my opinion is still the number one choice i would say but i like the fact that we've got a cavani in our squad regardless so it's still a bit too mismatched and like i said i just don't think skull shark's that great of a coach man i just don't you know he kind of looks like the manager that's going to rely solely on transfers and if that's the case that's all well and good but we don't have the infrastructure at the moment to allow him to succeed that way. We don't have a sporting director. And so, you know, maybe we've got the transfers right recently, but I still don't think they're right. You know, we signed that Uruguayan kid and where's he? We signed Diallo and he didn't even start for Atalanta, right? It doesn't really make any much sense. Um, so there's still too many holes for me to be convinced that we're going to win the league. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think we're going to push. We're obviously going to have a good end of season. And again, like I said, the one credit you have to give Solskjaer is that especially when you look at what's happening at Tottenham with Mourinho. He's done a great job, man. He's really lifted the spirits of the entire squad. Everyone seems really happy. Everyone's really up for it. Everyone seems like they like being around each other. They're enjoying playing whatever style football that we're playing. And at the moment, I don't know what it is, but wherever we're playing, they seem to be enjoying it. Um, they're all rooting for each other. Um, the atmosphere just seems way more fun and jovial and just they seem like they're really having a whirl of a time and as much as it annoys me seeing Solskjaer do that weird green thing that he does at the end of the game I generally think that happiness and bubbliness has been such a cathartic and refreshing experience from the drab dreary nature of Jose Mourinho you're sort of seeing it now with Mourinho at Spurs where they're sort of faltering and they've kind of got a bit of a bad run you're seeing that bad side of you know Jose Mourinho come back out again and you're reminded of you know the horror that we had to put up with when he was at United so if, if anyone deserves any credit it's definitely soul shark in terms of improving the overall mood but i still think in terms of the clutch moments the big moments you look at what happened in champions league that was no fluke we had four games to qualify basically or three we only did one point for those three we stumbled all the way through um really odd team selections and substitutions he's learning but again he's been in the management for 10 plus years prior to coming to united right um it just doesn't make any sense you don't necessarily turn into a world-class manager after that long period of time there has to be some sort of evidence yes the norwegian league titles are there but i'm just not convinced that he is the guy and again the team also is isn't exactly the best in the league i'd say in that regard it's good but i don't think it's the best and of course man city you know they've got world-class manager they've got a team that it's essentially stacked full of talent in each position um they've got a style of play that seems to be ingrained in the players maybe we don't have as much experience as them playing that system um that we have at the moment but it's still more recognizable um i don't know it's just i just don't see it i would like to be proven wrong but i'm, I'm still enjoying the ride like i said um a few times on here i'm enjoying the 
I'm enjoying not being outside the top four and having to, you know, cry every week about us trying to beat Burnley to get fifth or something, right? I'm, pr- I'm I'm happy with that. And I'm sure at the end of the season, we'll be comfortably within the top four, maybe with a trophy under our arms, who knows? Uh, maybe two. Let's see what happens. But yeah, so far, so good. Next on the list, what do we have here? We have news here courtesy of The Verge. It said Uber is buying delivery service, delivery service service Drizzly for 1.1 billion. So if you fall, this is why sometimes I think stuff like Clubhouse is overvalued when Drizzly's only, in my opinion, going for 1.1 billion, considering how popular it is in the US. Um, I Obviously, I don't use it here in the UK. But from what I know and have listening to a lot of startup um, podcasts and stuff and just people within that San Fran, LA, West Coast scene, and sometimes people on the East Coast, they're always name dropping Drizzly. It's essentially like the, you know, the Uber Eats platform for alcohol. It links various um, uh, liquor stores all across America on one platform and you get access to all these amazing places that you probably wouldn't know of prior and they get a chance to put their inventory up on a you know direct to order platform a courier picks it up for you and delivers it to your home in it pretty simple idea but it's very very popular especially during lockdown when people's you know drinking habits have just continually skyrocketed during this time so you know um that's why I think is somewhat undervalued for 1.1 billion when you consider club assets essentially going for 1 billion and it seems like there's a lot shorter of a runway there's a lot shorter of a platform to develop in terms of clubhouse vis-a-vis drizzly right i I said earlier i think a lot of the success of clubhouse does come to is partly due to the fact that they align themselves with this kind of exclusivity thing then of course they had the after the the first wave of the vcs and versus the journalists sort of debate that happened on clubhouse maybe at the beginning of last year or maybe middle of last year then they somehow decided it was a great idea to tap into the urban hip-hop community which then led to another bump in the terms of numbers but i think um they're kind of overestimating the reach and the appeal of clubhouse i think as well part of the reason why it's so successful is because we're in lockdown because we're living under some version um of a quarantine wherever we are with the covid that we've got um, living with at the moment so people are on their phones more and they're more willing to engage with these sort of apps so i think it might end up being a uh, meerkat or house party of its time where it's only effective when you've got nothing else to do but once the outside world reopens it's not going to be as fun but let's read the article here it says uber announced today that it's buying alcohol um, service drizzly in a deal worth 1.1 billion as the ride sharing company continues to build out its its sub stable of food and other delivery services the eventual plan is for drizzly's marketplace beer wine and liquor to be integrated into the existing uber eats application giving uber users a one-stop shop for both food drink and deliveries the existing drizzly app will stick around though so that's pretty cool I, well i guess it's cool it depends if you'd like the drizzly app and it's a it's got a better UI than or UX than uh, the Uber Eats app. But I know with Uber Eats or Uber in general, they do have now an option before you could do the bike separately. It's all kind of interlinked in terms of what you can select. I'm pretty sure. Let me see on mine. I'm pretty sure if you click the top, it sort of shows you the services that Uber has and Uber Eats have. Yeah. So, okay. Wow. That's pretty cool. I didn't see that. So you've got, you've got all this, right? You know, it doesn't matter but in terms of you know what screen uber looks like you've got a top you've got ride you've got food you've got transit so if you pick food it goes it sends you to um to uber eats you click transit it sends you uh i'm assuming oh wow so is this like a journey plan i don't know if you know you had this on here and if you click ride, it takes you straight to the riding stuff so that's pretty interesting way to do things so the fully the full integration makes sense and then when you purchase these sort of companies it probably makes sense more sense to do this sort of stuff but yeah um, it's continue. Blah, blah, blah. It's a Drizzly is effectively an online delivery storefront for existing local liquor stores. The company will partner with local sellers that enlist the delivery drivers, similar to Uber Eats, to handle delivery. The service is now available with over 1,400 cities across the United States. The deal marks the latest delivery focus move in uber's part in recent months even as it's begun to sell to less profitable parts of the business last year uber sold off its autonomous vehicle and flying divisions as it sought to be more profitable so yeah let's see man 
These moves uh, followed Uber's failed attempt to purchase Grubhub last year, along with the successful acquisition of Postmates over the summer for 2.65 billion. So Postmates was valued a lot more than um, Drizzly. Interesting, the company has also recently started to move into the on-demand grocery delivery, beginning in Latin America and Canada, and expanded in Uber Health Service to add prescription delivery. Um, the acquisition of Drizzly fits neatly into expanding delivery focus approach for Uber. But yeah, man, look at that. All everything is direct now essentially covid has just exasperated these things like it's just made it um it's just brought the future closer to the present really i, I think this was always bound to happen but with the world with the way the world is and considering how the after effects of covid will be felt for maybe months years to come it makes complete sense that they decide to sort of um go out and acquire a business like drizzly because it's only going to get bigger um probably best to kind of get in there now whilst they're only valued at 1.1 before you go before you well why is you going to push on one point one because you know the price is going to go up so yeah interesting to see how that develops and i wonder if do we have a, we must have a similar thing in the uk if you know if there's a similar drizzly app in the uk let me know in the comments down below i'd love to i'd love to check it out if that's possible so if you know of any app that's similar to drizzly um that delivers what is it alcohol what did they say what well, the from three main pillars here uh la, 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 la. three main pillars are liquor you know what i'm talking about isn't it? alcohol and liquor right they are liquor yeah, beer wine and liquor so if you know of any platforms that deliver beer wine and liquor let me know in the comments down below that'll be much appreciated what else is next here Ah, uh, we got this one and this is funny this is hilarious this is courtesy of deaf noodles my number one go-to source for all influencer related news of people who i didn't know about prior and now i know everything about because i'm spending way more time on my phone than i would like because we're living in a lock <laughs> so this is courtesy of Def Noodle that says instant regret Charlie D'Amelio sees here for Charlie and assumes it's for her um, it's actually Charlie XEX fans are tweeting support of X Charlie TX who's mourning the passing of her friend the great the influential the innovative Sophie so I guess over the last couple of days and for the unfortunate news of Sophie pioneering pop act um, passed away and then I guess a lot of people were basically um, showing their support and then they kind of remembered, oh shit, Charlie XCX is one of her close friends and hasn't shared anything on social media in, let's say, 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever it may be. So people are worried and thinking, oh, she must be really going through it because she's spoken so glowingly of her admiration of Sophie and how much she meant to, means to her and how much impact she had on her career, blah, 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 blah. So people were, you know, doing what nice, decent people do and basically, you know, putting out a hashtag and saying, hey, if you see this, Charlie, we're here for you. We've got us in your thoughts. Uh, stay strong. And for some reason, Charlie D'Amelio, who I guess is going through her own, again, the only reason why I know people because of social, because I'm stuck indoors, don't judge me. But basically, Charlie D'Amelio is one of the most followed or the number one followed person on TikTok. She's one of the girls that does all the little dances and shit with the, uh, the brunette with the little cherub cheeks. She's been going through a little bit of a scandal here and there, as you, go, as you do when you're that age and you're just, you know, filthy rich with all the access in the world. You're bound to make some mistakes. But she constantly seems to be in the news for all the wrong things you think, quote unquote. So it's within reason that she saw the hashtag and thought, you know what, that's for me. But the funny thing is that once you click the hashtag, it doesn't take long. It maybe takes a couple of reads. I think on the actual, um, on the uh, on the actual, on the actual, yeah, on the actual hashtag itself. Maybe a part because there's always a. I think on Twitter there's always a there's like a weird community of stan accounts that exist right i'm not sure if they're all bots or if they're all managed by people but these accounts that basically uh purposely try to alter the algorithms to get certain bits of news out and get their tweet of the person that they love follow just a strange weird world but once you sift through all the bots that are basically using as opportunity to um cap for d'amelio sister um it's pretty easy to see that it's an xcxc quote it's an xcxc um support hashtag and not for the media so um it's just funny that she didn't read it at all and she probably did what 99 percent of us do when we're looking at news on our instagram feed or to social media feed we just look at the headlines which is why it's just funny because a lot of people complain about clickbait headlines and say oh man they are journalists are good out there painting the wrong picture of people da, 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 da. But the truth is we don't actually read the articles because these platforms know these media companies know they have all the analytics and they know people don't go further than maybe the opening two paragraphs of any article so they try and get as much information 
information as they can at the top just think of the daily mail right all the flipping information is essentially in the title and they summarize it within the bullet points underneath the actual headline itself so it's basically relevant to read the article itself so um that, that's that's the case but it's just funny that if she just would have read it she would have known instantly it wasn't about her so this is it and I guess um, someone at Twitter was being a bit shady and decided to write this summary under the actual trend and says fans are clearly, uh, fans clarified that the here for Charlie hashtag was meant for XCX uh, after the death of her friend and fellow artist Sophie, not Charlie the Emilio. And then the next page, it's got here. I'm looking through these here for Charlie hashtags. Oh my good, that's, that's her response, right? I'm looking through it. Oh my goodness, you're all so sweet to me. I have no idea how much your kind words warm my heart. I'm so lucky to have you all by my side. I love you, babes which is an odd thing to say in it in social in general this whole love and you guys are support like it's just strange because the relationship is pretty one way right you don't really give a crap about your fans really right in that way especially these people right it's not really a it's not like a relationship like an artist in music would have with their fan base right where there is maybe a closer tie kin because of the words that you say in your songs and when you release your stuff this is just you doing dances that aren't really dances in front of a camera um on a very specific platform for a very specific group of people so it's very strange that whole lovey-dovey thing with fans anyway and that side of things but regardless um someone replied to her said that Anyways, R.I.P. to Sophie, an incredibly talented trans woman and a friend of Charlie XCX, who the hashtag was actually about, who you will, you will forever be missed. Of course, we always want to repeat that. And then someone said here, who's going to tell Charlie we mean Charlie XCX? <laughs> it's just incredibly embarrassing, right? Situation to be involved in. I think someone else here, more people clarifying tweets here saying... The here for Charlie was for XCX. Um, SGE is grieving over a friend she lost. Charlie D'Amelio risked the lives of many people by going to Bahamas. Stop being insensitive, Duncans. Um, and it continues. Her fans are very weird for playing along instead of informing her that the hashtag was for Charlie XCX. But again, it's not much of an informing. All she had to do was read a couple more tweets. She just couldn't be bothered to do it. She was maybe too busy dancing, I guess, isn't it? Another one said her stands need to stop. The hashtag was meant for XEX and who is mourning the death of Sophie. Um, but again, it should be embarrassing, right? This should be highly embarrassing, but we live in a post-embarrassment world. We live in a post-shame world. It doesn't exist. Shame is essentially currency shame is an opportunity to boost your signal to amplify your voice no one has any shame anymore so normal person would feel utterly embarrassed by this and will probably hide the hide under their duvet for a couple of days before coming out and you know with their tail in between their legs and offering a groveling apology or clarifying that they didn't know what happened and they didn't do it on purpose or whatever explain the situation away but in this case you don't you just pretend it didn't happen you continue on because shame does not exist next on the list what else do we have here we have some great news on the podcasting front um it was announced just today actually i've just finished listening to the episode but joe budden podcast has signed ex well, not exclusive it has signed a partnership deal with patreon and joe is also joining uh patreon as a chief equity advisor or oh, yeah, chief equity advisor has to be a chief equity advisor so um it's all looking good man it's all looking good after um after this, after this headlines or says after nick in nixing the spotify pact joe budden launches patreon subscription and joins creator equity as visor so a lot of people had a lot of things to say when the spotify deal crumbled because it did follow a supposed pattern that exists with joe budden where he is quite self-destructive and he ends up fucking or fumbling the bag as they say on the internet and um you know people for some reason I'm not sure what it is about business and artistry but it does seem to be a lot of like armchair quarterbacks that exist on social media and within the kind of commentary community right um i wouldn't say i myself included i wouldn't say that because i'm an, I'm an actual practitioner like i actually go out and do things i put on events i dj in parties um i release things when i you know get around to doing it but i wouldn't say i'm in that category but there are a lot of people who seem to have a lot to say about other people's business dealings um when i would imagine if they were put in the same position they'd probably negotiate a worse deal right so it's very strange how people are going over that i understand the premise i understand the desire to get involved because i do think there's been too much said about the bad deals that exist in 
in the industry, wherever you, wherever industry you're in, and not enough said about the people who are negotiating these deals, just getting themselves into bad deals in general, um, and the fact that there are good deals that do exist out there. But if you're in a good deal, you're not going to share out the rooftops. You're just going to keep your counsel and keep it moving. So um, for all the people that were quick to kind of write him off and say that he didn't necessarily get the best out of the Spotify deal and he fumbled the bag and he fucked over his co-host and all this other stuff now is probably the time to kind of give him these flowers and recognize that maybe the long game that he sort of worked out for himself and the idea that he had in terms of his morals and what he was trying to um look at in terms of the overall picture and what message he was trying to send by signing the deal is basically been proven right because joining patreon as an advisory in an advisory role or any role in that in that sense even if you made it up is very very important for the overall journey and picture of where they're going as a podcast and as a network and it does represent and it does kind of showcase because it's important it's, it shouldn't be but these sort of like commercial mainstream acknowledgements of what you're doing especially when you're a black person are very important because the narrative needs to be rewritten right things need to change in terms of how you're viewed as a race as a community and the only way to do it is to kind of align yourself with these mainstream brands and then basically do what you were doing prior and hold the door open for others to come in and then the kind of conversation starts to change because it's no coincidence that there has been as much as there's been an influx of artists infiltrating grime hip-hop um, techno music house dj whatever it may be there is still a lot of people who have also started operating and starting up studios, record labels, uh, being managers, you know, whatever it may be. A lot of people are getting into it in general. And I think it has a lot to do with the visibility of these people who look like you basically saying, hey, if you love music, you don't always just have to be a rapper or a singer. You can also work in these avenues. And I think the way Joe's all like pushing things forward with the podcasting platform is great too, because it's definitely showing people that there's another avenue you can come into um, in terms of the hip hop space that you know kind of lends itself to the podcast and commentary commentary sort of platform as opposed to standing in front of a microphone which is you know turning into a, a very um profitable side of the business only for a small amount of people right and for the most part who's really making the big bucks during streaming era at home nowadays even if you stream you know a million you're still not getting that much it's only the top top eyes that are making it so there definitely needs to be an acknowledgement that, hey there needs to be another there needs to be another route into making some kind of income that exists out there. So let's read the article here from Variety. It says the following, Joe Biden thinks um, he got shafted by Spotify in his podcast. Now he's throwing it in with Patreon, the platform built to let artists and creators support themselves through fan subscriptions. And Biden, a top podcaster and prominent voice in the hip-hop community, has signed on to work with Patreon to promote its mission of fostering creative independence. Looking to expand his media brand, Biden has launched a Joe Biden network on Patreon, offering a range of bonus content and perks to subscribers on their three different tiers. Biden also joined Patreon in an advisory role as a head of creator content, sorry, head of creator equity which is great considering the if you listen to the show you know that's a great title for him considering the rants he goes on about splits and what people should be earning and turning down certain deals and whatever it may be a paid position which in which he'll collaborate with the company in a creator programs and policies i liked how they um it's interesting to his variety because he's always speaking about how nice he, how much he loves variety so it's cool that they kind of reached out and did a story with him so big up them um and obviously pointing out that it's, it's a paid position it's not just a, a role um in name only that's great to see let's continue on after his acrimonious split with Spotify last year, I spoke to everybody he said under the sun. I spoke to a lot of companies, but the true value of things about the true value of things. Uh, but then landed a phone call with Jack Conte, CEO of Patreon, and the two clicked. He said, we were aligned in our ideology and our view of things. I walked away from those conversations with a good feeling having a platform like Patreon actually wanted to do the right for creators. Um, that was such an abnormal feeling, but it shouldn't be for sure. Conti, who confirmed the Patreon in 2013 after he grew frustrated with trying to eke out a living on YouTube as an indie musician, said he established a company precisely to give creators like Budden financial and creative freedom. He said tech companies pay creators the minimum that they can get away with. It's not just a Spotify thing, it's YouTube, it's Facebook, Facebook, Google. Um, these platforms are paying creators a fraction of what they are worth. Conti said Joe and I share the anger and the unwillingness to put up with the BS with these distributors and the current infrastructure. So they're actually a match made in heaven. Visually, right? Too bold beard bearded dudes but also in terms of how they view the industry and how they view um the revenue splits that creators get on the internet which is still a bit of a murky world so 
definitely a great alignment there. Uh, Patreon offers three different pack packages for its creators. The additional packages and benefits are higher levels, light with the company taking 5% of the earnings, pro 8%, premium 12%. Each of these is lower than the revenue sharing splits on virtually all platforms they take. So um, that's nice. It says members who join the new joe budden network on patreon.com for slash joe budden will have access to a range of exclusive benefits the entry level homies tier five dollars per month includes one bonus video uh podcast per month priority notice on live events and access to a members only chat community on discord family at ten dollars per month steps that up to two bonus episodes per month plus merch and discounts and patron only polls live event pre-sale codes uh friend of the show 25 dollars per month includes all of those plus joe network joe budden's network franchise content including behind the scenes content and episodes on a new show called journey it says here we have so much more to say with the state of the world budden said beyond the regular twice weekly podcast with his friends jamal mark clay and rory farrell this is for the fans who want more access budden said he never considered putting anything behind a paywall i don't I, I don't believe in stepping off the porch and taking and start asking for something for your audience budden thought he took his post uh podcast off of spotify last month yeah we know about that last year sorry uh for his part spotify yeah spotify replied it's just funny right they said here spotify said you'll do a streamer made budden a considerable offer that was many times the value of the existing agreement and effective of the current market and sizable audience in the end budden walked away calling spotify proposal a bum ass deal <laughs> i love that they include that a bum ass deal he's he's being proven right there in the end isn't it like again i've, I've listened to maybe um, to be completely honest again this is me being a big joe rogan fan i've been listening to every episode since probably about episode 200 i've listened to maybe five episodes in full on spotify since the move um the app is just shit it doesn't work well you have to use your own you have to use the native the native the, the app on the sorry the, the desktop application doesn't work great the app works pretty decently um it plays a video in the background which i don't like you can't just listen to it as an audio version and it's just a horrible experience all in all i mean i've listened to an episode in full like i said only five since the move to spotify and he's been proven right man it's just not the best platform that exists it can get move to the side it can maybe maybe it's not necessarily optimized for podcasts in general so for you to kind of sign a deal on there knowing that they're not doing all they can to make the best out of the situation makes no sense and i also think this tiered system of you know uh, allowing fans who want to and have the ability to send you a couple of bucks at the end of the month is really good and something that i have hope a lot more artists in music do especially the ones who are you know struggling at the moment in terms of not being able to do live shows that's a great way to kind of you know allow access into what you do and also provide you with an opportunity to make some money i mean like concurrently you know with people just currently paying you a couple of bucks or five dollars per month minimum that's a lot of p coming in there um because it is here patrons hoping that they are recruiting button in or track creators which is great right so they're not even looking just for the in terms of you know they're happy that he's going to make a lot of money because they are right like joe Biden network is going to absolutely smash it on there um they're going to get a lot of patrons especially when you consider how high paid some of the other people are like tim dylan gets like 50 grand per month um flagrant two gets about that come town boys get about that maybe 60 70 grand per month so those dudes then they, again they don't do as much content as these guys are promising they're going to put out especially to a the level they're going to do it to for the community that likes to do this sort of thing i definitely think they're going to end up cashing out in a really big way but it's interesting that they are aiming this um partnership more so at getting more creators on the platform because i guess for patreon the way they make money is vis-a-vis -vis the amount of if they have more creators on there willing to make content it's going to drive more people to go on there to buy that content or subscribe to it which is then going to lead to them being able to take more uh more little fees out for more creators and like yeah that makes sense yeah that makes sense it continues here more than 200,000 creators earn an income on patreon from a total of more than 6 million patrons the company has paid more than 2 billion to creators since its formation according to Conte last September the company announced 90 million in new funding giving it a valuation of 1.2 billion said here the financial model in the first 20 years of the web was turning it into a billboard that works and it exploded that was awesome for distribution the trouble is hundreds of years of payment models got left by the wayside and we've forgotten the ad supported internet content he argued comes with a horrible trade-offs uh, around data privacy misinformation and human psychology uh, companies like patreon netflix cameo substack are pushing the next phase about solving financials for creators i'm so pumped for that 
in Budden, the rowers and advisor Conti said he's going to help us to be a megaphone for us about the gap between creator worth and value. Uh, besides acting as an ambassador for Patreon, Budden will provide input on what kinds of programs the company should launch. Budden said he's working on Patreon for to address everything what's wrong with the monetization system of creators. It's an issue he said that's going to be bigger than me, bigger than Jack, bigger than Patreon. That's flipping awesome. So don't be surprised if you see loads of musicians, your favorite, you know, up coming stars deciding to go on there, maybe putting out Patreon only albums or whatever it may be. It's definitely an avenue that I can definitely see booming in the near future. We continue on, and I'd say the only thing I'd say about that is a word of caution to Joe Budden and anybody else who decides to go on there and put a podcast behind a paywall. You're kind of seeing it happen a bit <clears throat> with the girls on Red Scare podcast, right? They decided to make some fairly um, racy takes on the whole AOC uh, capital building assault uh thing that's been going on on the interwebs at the moment right aoc basically got on instagram live and detailed her experience before at the capitol building protest um insurrection whatever you may be calling it and also revealed during that instagram live that she is a victim of sexual assault and basically you know reiterated how scary of an occasion that was some people took that as not as um some people didn't take it as uh, as harmless as it was and they basically saw that as another opportunity that she's basically using to basically cry victim and use that to bolster her political career and um the red skate girls had some very interesting takes in terms of how they view those kind of things and so far the reaction hasn't been great which is so it is what it is isn't it right you say something um controversial people are going to have their opinion but unfortunately in the world we live in at the moment you can't just say something controversial and people just either write you off or decide they're not going to listen to what you have to say um or kind of you know maybe you know delete their subscription whatever it may be there is a real there seems to be a tendency for people to go out of their way to ensure that you'll never have ability to make money again so they'll go and contact all your advertisers the platforms that you work with you saw it happen with the rescue girls prior right with when it comes to when it comes to that um isis merch that they put out for some reason you know people decided to go hit up Spotify, shopify and ask them why are you platforming these type of people they took down their site all this sort of nonsense happens um i think they even mentioned in a recent podcast they couldn't even get a collaboration with big lighters because of what happened prior and them getting removed from social media for a brief period of time i think it might be their twitter feed right so there's definitely a tendency for people to just not just be okay with not agreeing with your points but then going out their way to make sure that you don't have a quote-unquote platform so if that's the case and you're a Joe Biden podcast um, person you're gonna have to be very careful that they don't run into the same issue because I remember that came to came to me when the, the news got announced that back in 2018 Sam Harris decided to remove his podcast from um, Patreon because at the time I think they had taken off Sargon of a card and somebody else maybe uh i forgot her name the lady that does all the stuff about migrants and stuff but she shifted that i forgot her name blonde lady but a few people who you would maybe say are center right or something um or maybe mostly all right it doesn't really matter but regardless they kind of buck the trend of uh what most platforms are which is you know in, in, in interestingly more liberal and maybe democratic in their sort of politics and they kind of took them off right and there was no real reason as to why that was and i remember at the time jack conte was getting a lot of heat online he didn't really answer the question he kind of skirted around it he ignored it there was a lot of um kind of uh talking in circles and eventually we just got to a point where everyone just kind of got to a silent understanding that maybe patreon doesn't necessarily like the more controversial slash racy opinions that come from people that occupy the right side uh, or the conservative side of politics so if that's the case they're going to be very very careful this is an article here from the new york times that kind of explains a little bit about it it says patreon bars anti-feminist um for racist speech inciting revel of course it's new york times so the headline's a bit you know um what do you call it and it's nelly balls too right this is the lady that was essentially one of the people that was responsible for jordan peterson's breakdown do you remember she was the one that wrote that article where she basically pretended to be their friends when they went on tour and then written and scathing hip hit piece about him using the term um i'm gonna say what was it it was something gender imagine gender enforced monogamy right he used some sort of yeah i thought it was an enforcement it was some social sociological term that you use right it's a scientific term basically and she took that and purposely um misrepresented it as him basically saying this might have been during the era of um 
what's that thing made handmaid's tail show so she made it seem as if like he was um championing for women to basically live under that kind of level of tyranny completely horror in this and it take from it but she's the journalist that was involved in ellie ball so it shouldn't be a surprise but you know what we'll, we'll, let's, let's continue so this is back in 2018 it says sam harris the polemic atheist neuroscientist i love how they put all these things in front of your name or after your name so that people can write you off the instant they see you <laughs> uh polemic uh neuroscientist known for his popular podcast waking up was making thousands of tens of thousands of dollars per month from fans who donated to him via patreon a craft and son now let's not let's let's remember he was making i think at the time if i remember fifty thousand dollars on patreon per month and he took the noble decision and again he didn't know these guys have got removed from the platform he just said nah i can't in good conscience stay on a platform that will one day decide that my opinions aren't um you know aren't viable or aren't don't viable what they're about and just take me off there right which is basically has been proven right with the occasions that have been happening prior but it continues or since so um that stopped this month on december the 6th patreon kicked the anti-feminist polygamy poly, polemic sorry carl benjamin who goes under the name sargon of a card off his site for using racist language on youtube which is i think that was a big controversy right why is it that you can say one thing on one platform that's going to affect your ability to stay on another platform which just didn't make any sense i think eventually he did get kicked off youtube too so you know the whole idea about all these platforms being in cahoots is looking a little bit more um has a little bit more weight to it it said here that same week and removed the right wing provocateur milo yannapolis a day after he opened an account that moves prompted a revolt mr harris citing uh, worries about censorship announced that he would be leaving patreon he also he was joined in this protest by a half a dozen other prominent members of the site including conservative leaning psychologists again it's all these labels they put on people in there why can't it just be psychologists why has to be conservative leaning jordan peterson and libertarian podcaster dave rubin who also earned money on patreon and again these two people all make i'm gonna say david rumor had the lowest but still his income was easily 20 grand plus on patreon i know jordan peterson was making bank on there too maybe 50 at the time of his peak so these were people that were raking in a lot of money and they basically took the principal decision and maybe out of fear too because it's probably better to jump the ship before you get pushed off right so if you're telling people hey i'm going to leave give them notice you can maybe siphon them off to your own platform which sam harris did uh behind a paywall but still it was a big step to take you don't just write off that kind of income if you don't have some sort of level of ethical backbone right in you it continues these recent expulsions seem more readily explained by the political bias mr harris wrote in his followings the forum is a microcosm of the conflicts that are playing out across the internet as technology platforms try to limit the spread of hateful speech which again i'm not really a fan of um i just i don't know i i just think at the moment especially now with the world that we live in these things should they i wouldn't say they're like a human right but they're close to it right they're they're close enough to a human right at this point in time um social media especially um especially platforms like twitter and instagram and facebook like if you're not on those platforms you're basically out of the public conversation and that shouldn't be something that should be determined by a platform it should be determined by us we should be able to decide hey we don't want to listen to you anymore and we just turn away and go that way but in this world for some reason you, you things are not allowed to exist unless everybody lets them exist right or or certain platforms let them exist that's the odd thing i don't i've never really understood why can't we just live in a world where okay if milo yannapolis is this provocateur who says crazy shit that the market is able to decide whether or not he's able to make an income or whether he's able to play in certain places right because if you've got a private business or i don't know an, a, a platform business not maybe a venue whatever it may be called and he wants to host a seminar there you're well within your rights to say no because you don't like his opinions but i think the platforms themselves have to remain somewhat apolitical i think that makes for a far more interesting world and again i just think it does more harm than good when you push these people out in the fringes look what happened with the capital building insurrection some people could it could be said it's a bit of a stretch but you could say if you didn't kick all these people off twitter in the first place there wouldn't be a parlor it wouldn't exist right um there'd be no need for a more racier place where people can say you know jewish slurs and racial slurs in peace and feel as if like they're empowered that wouldn't exist if you somehow moderated it better on twitter in the first place so um it doesn't necessarily bode well going forward again I, I, i'm hopeful that it will be okay you know 
podcasts like come down exist on patreon so it should be all right for the joe banner podcast but i do think it's a word of warning that eventually you will get to a point where your non-political point of view is out you're essentially using to gain more subscribers because the whole point that you got a patron right you want to offer a platform or a space where you can maybe say more racier things can also be used against you because the racier things that you say probably are going to land yourself in a um in a what you call it uh in some sort of political argument with that you didn't necessarily want to be in in the first place but unfortunately with the world that we live in everything is politics right um for some weird sense but hey what can you do we move on okay so this is another one okay this is a story here courtesy of the guardian it says Reverend Rachel Wood and four other women accused Marilyn Manson of abuse. Manson describes the allegations as horrible distortions of reality after record label drops him from their roster. So um, this, of course, is another uh, another one. I guess this isn't much of a surprise if you are a big Marilyn Manson fan, which I am. Right, I had my Marilyn Manson phase when I was in secondary school, and I kind of followed his career from afar ever since then. Even though you know I've kind of stopped maybe listening to his music as much as I did in the past, but these rumors a bit about him being abusive to women always existed, but for some reason they never kind of gained any traction. But of course, in a post Me Too world, um, you know, issues of uh, female abuse are definitely met with a lot more. I definitely take it a lot more seriously than they were in the past. And um, I guess in this case with Evan Rachel Wood, she's always had a bit of a, she's always sort of put out stories or said things that you could interpret as they being an indication of something untoward happened in her relationship with Marilyn Manson. So when she did finally come out and basically name him as her abuser, everyone was kind of like, oh, I, I knew it, right? Because if you followed her career, uh, or if you followed Marilyn Manson and you know who Evan Rachel Wood is, you would know that she has been saying, you know, without saying in between words, you know, that this guy basically, you know, has been an abuser for a very, very long time. And I guess now she feels crazy enough to say it. So let's read through the the story and i'll give you my opinion on the other side it says here um evan rachel wood has accused her former partner marilyn manson of years of horrific abuse in an instagram post the actor wrote the name of my abuser is brian warner also known to the world as marilyn manson he started grooming me when i was a teenager and horrifically abused me for years i was brainwashed manipulated into submission i am done living in fear of retaliation slander and blackmail i'm here to expose this dangerous man and call out the many industries that have enabled him before he ruins anymore i stand with the many victims who will no longer be silent so a very straight to the point um statement there you know highlighting exactly who it was pointing the finger at who she thinks is responsible and basically saying i'm not going to rest until you are um, held, resp held responsible for your actions it continues for other women ashley walters sarah mcnally um ashley morgan and gabriella with no surname given have alleged abusive behavior via instagram posts mcnally and walters allege physical and emotional abuse including behavior they characterize as torture morgan alleges sexual and physical violence and coercion gabriella alleges rape physical violence that manson forced her to take drugs jesus christ described the manson described the allegations a horrible torture reality in a statement shot on instagram he said obviously my art and my life have been um, magnets for controversy but these recent claims about me are horrible torture of reality my intimate relationship have always been entirely consensual with like-minded partners regardless of how and why others are now choosing to misrepresent the past that is the truth the guardian has contacted representative mason's um, company and record label manson has categorically denied and previously allegations of sexual abuse made by anonymous women to 18 we remember that one dating back to 2011 um, which was thrown out due to the absence of cooperation and the statute of limitations being expired manson's lawyer had called the allegations completely delusional after today's allegations manson's record label loma vista recordings dropped him from its roster loma vista will cease to further promote the current album effective immediately due to these concerning developments we have also decided not to work with marilyn manson on any future projects i wonder what's happening with record labels I wonder if it's always been a contract um clause in there that if you get involved in something it must be right because artists are crazy and they do dumb things it must just be a clause that they've always had in record labels where if you do anything dumb that maybe uh puts the label in a bad light they can immediately drop you because there must be some legal recourse to it right especially if they've invested money or you invested time i don't know i wonder if that's or maybe because they're the lender they have more hearsay it's just interesting that labels are much quicker nowadays to drop people than they were in the past it feels like it feels like in the past labels were the last people to drop you and they were the ones that were getting the most hassle online but they just wouldn't because it's hard to 
it's hard to attack a record label because it's faceless, isn't it? There's no one person that you can basically attack your eye to. So this is interesting. But regardless, it goes on. Uh, Wood and Manson began dating in 2017 uh, or 2007. Sorry, when she was 19 years old, and he was 37. She inspired his 27 um, 2007's hit "Heart Shape uh, Glass" uh, song. When the heart guides the hand, their relationship ended in 20, 2008. Manson told an interview in uh, 2009, "I have fantasies every day about smashing her skull in the Sanjay and said that he'd self harmed following the breakup. They reconciled, got engaged in 2010, and split again later that year. In 2018, Wood appeared before the U.S. Um, Judicial Committee amid campaign for a 2016 um, Bill of Rights Act to be inducted, enacted across the U.S. and detailed her experiences of various forms of abuse. Oh yeah, I remember this from an unnamed person. Yeah, that's when I think a lot of people, when they saw her speaking, came to the conclusion that it was definitely Marilyn Manson. Um, so no one can say that she's suddenly invented these stories. She's definitely been feeling like this for a while. She said that in the wake of the attack, she was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress order and had self harm and attempted suicide. All the four of the other women who alleged abuse against Manson say they have been suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. In 2019, Wood testified at the California Senate Council Polit uh, Public Safety Committee in support of the bill expanding the rights of victims of domestic violence. She said an unnamed abuser who met her in her late teens made threats against her life, sometimes with deadly weapons amid allegations uh, of domestic abuse in which um, he also tortured and starved her, surveilled her phone usage and threatened her with blackmail. Manson was questioned about the testimonies in an interview of Metal Hammer in 2020 and cut the interview short. A press representative later said Ever Rachel Wood dated multiple people around that time. She dated Manson and the Sledgehammer comment was ob obviously a theatrical rock star interview promoting his new record, not a factual account. They complained of gossip and conjecture and highlighted the 2015 interview Wood in which he said Manson appreciate everything he taught me. Wood said in 2018 a lot of rumours have been circulated about um, who I was talking about in my testimony. I'd like to clear up some things. It wasn't Ricky Rourke. We were never together. <laughs> That's really funny. In 2018, uh, Manson also accused of accused harassing women on the set of TV drama House, which he did not comment on in 21, 2001. He was charged with assault. Da, da, da. Yeah, since his 2019 debut, Manson has endured a career of, car of uh, cartoonishly gothic metal. None of his 11 studio albums have reached the US top 10. Most recently, We Are Cursed in September 2020, with 1998's Mechanical Animals, 2013's Golden Age of Grotesque reaching number one. So, of course, Realist allegations, right? Stuff that you can never really co-sign or endorse in any way, shape, or form. But it did get me thinking about um the future of artistry and you know people in general, creatives. You do get the feeling that the new order we're sort of moving into, there's gonna be less and less freaks and weirdos, right? Because it's no surprise when you hear the story about Marilyn Manson, right? Whether or not it's true or not, hearing the story, you're not taken aback. It's not like, oh my God, he did what? This makes complete sense. If you follow his career, you watch his interviews, you listen to his music, um, you see how he conducts himself in public, it would make sense that he would be this kind of guy to women, right? Um, so if that's the case, is, it, is there something to be said for, you can only be that level of artist if you've got that level of darkness inside of you, where you're willing to abuse both physically and mentally somebody that you supposedly love for a very very long period of time or for an intense period of time, especially a year when you're 19 and it's your first love right it's so intense i can only imagine so there's definitely something about that there's definitely something about these individuals who operate at that high level of artistry that seem to have this level of darkness in them that they simply can't shake so what i'm basically saying is is it possible to be a good person and be a very a great artist a sort of once in a generation artist an artist that inspires a legion of other artists in your field and other artists outside of your genre is that possible or do we kind of have to get to a place in the world where we accept that some of our more um out there people are going to be a little bit weird and they're going to do weird shit but you just can't judge it through the prism of what normal people do because they're not normal Right, I don't think Marilyn Manson's ever lived a normal life. He's always kind of um, operated on the outskirts of society. I remember what what podcast I listened to recently where someone just said like he just does coke every day nowadays. He's just allegedly what I've heard again allegedly. Um, somebody said in the podcast that he just does coke. He just racks lines up every day, gets smashed, and just wanders around taking bumps all the time. That's all he does. 
And if that's the case, and he's been doing this, you know, for decades on prior, again, like I said about the Octavian thing, his record label were aware, his management people were aware, production people he works with were aware, his close musical collaborators were aware, but they all turned a blind eye because he was just so fantastic in this other field. So I don't know, man, there's part of me that thinks it's bad, don't get me wrong, it is really bad, but this might just be a prerequisite of having great art. You're just always going to, your personal life is always going to be somewhat clouded in darkness and unfortunately fortun hopefully you don't have a trail of victims behind you once you do leave this earth or once things go on uh but it's definitely likely there's going to be a trail of people that you hurt along the way and i don't know whether it's just a, a fact of just knowing once you get in a relationship or once you stand next to this person that this might happen to you your life might never be the same or whether it's an education for the fans to realize that hey you can't judge this person through the prism of your normal people's eyes it has to be always judged through the prism of artistry because to be an artist of that level you just maybe have to have that chaotic and frantic life that you can kind of pull from to inform your music maybe who knows maybe i'm right maybe i'm wrong i don't know just throwing out an opinion out there don't hate me moving on we have what is this one yeah this is courtesy of sky news Sky News are reporting Amazon uh, boss Jeff Bezos is moving uh, sideways as Christmas quarter sales exceed 100 billion. Amazon have made 100 billion. God damn, in sales. Just the last quarter, not the year, quarter. God damn it. Okay, continues. Amazon co founder and CEO Jeff Bezos is to step down from running the business as it's reported record revenues for its core Christmas quarter, topping 100 billion, 73 billion pounds uh, for the first time with the help of the coronavirus pandemic. The e commerce, cloud data storage, and entertainment giant said Bezos would become an executive chair during the summer with Amazon Web Services chief Andy Jassy assuming the top job. I wonder what that salary is like for that job. How much do you think Amazon CEO? gets maybe because it's jeff bezos he gets a capped amount because he's the richest person in the world quote unquote or second right third doesn't matter he's got a lot of money maybe he caps it so that people don't give him any hate maybe i don't know i wonder what he gets in the average person is it 1.5 million 2 million 5 is it just 120 grand i wonder what it is um bezos said um the shift would give him more time to concentrate on his other passions including the fight against climate change and that the company's latest results demonstrate that it was the right time to make the transition of course imagine going out on that high in terms of business boardroom level that is another level in it that he's leaving um with record levels of you know profits or so record levels of sales um you know for the most important quarter to them which was last quarter during the christmas of course mitigating circumstances everyone's you know um living in some level of lockdown people are on their phones a lot loads of delivery apps are booming during this time but still amazing it says the yeah, amazon recorded a total sales of one point two five six billion between the months of october and december 2020 a period that took its annual prime day delayed from july for the first time black friday and holiday season business it represented 43 percent rise in the same period in 2019 as the covid 19 crisis hammered physical retailers forced to stampede to work from home and stoked demand for tv movie downloads during the the uh, lockdowns amazon said revenues for 2020 as a whole came in at 386 billion up to uh, 38 percent however the company range of services were placed at capitalize a pandemic distribution as core markets the cost of meeting the coronavirus safety requirements limited net profits to 21.3 um the company expected on wednesday to outline how the business performed in the uk business held the group's financial performance a combination of 26 years of work that saw him cap it cap catapult to the status of the world's richest person last year before being overtaken by Tesla Zeno Marx. He told investors, if you do it right, a few years after the surprising invention, the new f last what's that? If you do it right, a few years after a surprising invention, the new thing has become normal. People yawn. That yawn is the greatest accomplishment an inventor can receive. When you look at your financial results that you're um, actually seeing a uh, long-term combination of results of invention. Right now, I see Amazon as its most innovative ever, making it optimal time for this transition he said the new products will be uh, among the areas he will be prioritizing shares of flat in the after hours dealing despite the bombshell development and tampered by the fact that his core numbers exceeded the analyst predictions mad isn't it so i wonder what he's gonna do next what do you do next if you're jeff bezos and you got that sort of money um obviously 
he's a ser- he's serial entrepreneur. Yeah, you would. He's a, definitely a serial entrepreneur. So definitely going to be an aspect of him wanting to tap into something else. There's maybe an opportunity just to step away from the limelight because for all the good he's personally gained from this and his company, there's lot. there's been a lot of questions around, you know, the amount of money they've been able to make during the lockdown, the amount of money other industries have lost, um, you know, the lack of taxes they pay in certain places, blah, de, blah, blah, blah. So if there's a time to maybe give yourself a good bit of PR, a PR breather, you basically step away from the business because you're not intrinsically tied to it anymore because you're not there. And then you basically start something else anew to rejig your public perception, which I don't think he's that bothered about because he's not that media friendly. But I wonder if that's the thing. I wonder. But regardless, man, Joe Bezos steps aside and finds himself a new job. Let's see what that one will be. <clears throat> what else do we have here? Da, 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 da. Let's not do that one. Yes, yeah, do this one. What time are we at now? Oh yeah, we're at an hour and four. That's perfect. Perfect timing. So, um, let's end it with this one. So, have you guys seen this? Um, Lil Uzi Vert decided to get himself a, what would you say that is? Twenty-four million diamond dollar, uh, diamond, diamond dollar, diamond <laughs> in the middle of his forehead, um. Which is again very on brand if you're familiar with Lil Uzi and his music and his artistry. It's not that I don't think controversial. Yes, I guess it's a massive jewel in the middle of his forehead, but in terms of who it's on, it makes complete sense. Um, you see an image here on the screen with the jeweler placing it in the middle, him showing some of his friends. I think at the time that he put it on, the swelling around the top made it look a bit horrible, look like a gunshot wound, like someone mentioned in the comments. But it looks pretty badass to be honest and definitely something representative of him as a person overall um and then here you've got this video from academics i said just dropped out uh flexing on these hoes a video of him actually st- saying with the it does look pretty cool though let's let's be honest it does look pretty cool it's probably gonna the reason maybe the reaction's been a bit you know split on the web it kind of represents this. you remember when gucci Mane got his ice cream tattoo on his face and people started freaking out because at the time he was going for a little bit of a mental breakdown it seemed like people were basically saying oh this is a sign of him crying for help but at the end you know we've now seen people you know tattooing pencils on their heads drake and stuff it became normal over time so maybe we'll see a lot more people inserting these diamonds in parts of their faces um you know as a way to accessorize themselves and differentiate themselves from fellow artists who have the same amount of money and same amount of jewels um but yeah the swelling is kind of dying slowing down a little bit little by little it started to look a bit good but i think some of the con- some of the comments or kickback from it was that it wasn't centered it didn't look that great and then i guess he got on instagram and clarified that i guess it's just a swelling that makes it look not centered and the fact that there's a bar i guess which is quite a good idea instead of just placing it directly in the middle they put a little bar there um and then the diamond basically sits on the bar so that it kind of can move around so you know makes it easy for it to just stay where it should be so let's hear in Lil Uzi Bert's words himself, what he has to say regarding it. So it's actually in the middle. It's John in the middle. I just got a long bar in it because I just got it pierced and the swelling, when the swelling go down. So it's actually in the middle. I get a short bar so it won't move. That's fair. I keep talking about this off because I got a long bar in it so it can move because it's swelling. That's pretty cool. And when it go down, I get a short bar. It's going to be right there. But yeah, um, artist, artist. You know, I don't know, man. I, I, I don't really have much to say. I think it's pretty cool. I quite like how it looks personally. Um, I do think we need space for our more, uh, what would you call them? for our more 
what do you call them? How do you refer to them? Would you refer to them as expressive, exoteric, whatever that word is, right? We need a space for these artists to exist. We don't want everyone just to kind of look the same. They already look the same anyway with the dreads and the tattoos and the flipping designer clothing. If they want to have a little thing that kind of, you know, separates them from their crew of people and rappers that they're around, that it happens to be a massive 24 million dollar diamond in the middle of their head, then so be it. It? it looks pretty cool personally uh, it'd be interesting to see how this evolves because what ended up happening there end up being a whole bunch of people who end up jumping on a bandwagon and doing the same thing and doing their own little way so it'd be interesting to see how this evolves whether or not it turns into people getting you know teardrops of little diamonds on their face whether people end up getting little smaller diamonds in the middle of their forehead maybe in other places maybe on the corner of their head and their hairline there's definitely going to be people doing similar things going forward for sure maybe above the eyebrow i can see that being a thing um again he, he's the first through the door he's going to get most of the hate regarding it but i do think it looks pretty badass i'm not going to lie it looks really really cool man um probably hurt like a bitch probably is why he's high as a kite here he had to kind of numb himself in the pain but it is what it is it is what it is Anyway, that's the Exit English episode number 429. Thanks for tuning in. As per usual, it's been a pleasure to have your company. If you first time tuning into the show, make sure you smash the like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app. Of course, make sure you leave me a five-star review and share with your friends. Until next time, see you again. Peace.